already. Um, hi, looks like we're back up on time, and uh, we're making pretty good progress through this. Great. Um, I put the slides up here, and I'll, I'll boost the point size a bit. But the, uh, over in the advanced course, <clears throat> they published all the slides. This is a question that came up actually a few times today. Um, but for, for all of the lectures that happened earlier this morning, they published the slides about those if you want to catch up on that. Um, in the afternoon, the advanced course will be going through exercises based on this material. Um, so, I mean, if you want to drop over there, if you have particular interests in GraphX and MLlib, et cetera, um, you know, please feel free. It's great to bounce back and forth as long as there's room. Um, we will be covering Spark SQL and uh, Spark Streaming here, not in as much detail, obviously, as, as they can be doing in the advanced course. Um, but I, I just want to make this available. I, this is under a URL that just went back up. It's spark-summit.org 2014 under training. And uh, we'll get back in here to the API as the next section. Pardon? It's down? Is it? Ah, this thing's been going up and down. Okay. Um, let me. Let me see if I can do some magic here. Data bricks training. Data bricks training index. Yep. I'm trying to see if there's anything here that we could salvage. Well, there's no issues. Okay. Um, during the break, then, I'll, I'll try to get them to post the, uh, the slides up on AWS. That'll be easier to work with. Um, if you really want to get them, I'm sure we can probably grab them off of a USB stick somewhere, too. Um, next time, if uh, Pat McDonald comes in, uh, we'll grab him. I think during the next section, we don't anticipate a lot of uh, compatibility problems in terms of uh, different environments. So most of the TAs have moved off into um, the first part of the advanced section. But once they get going, uh, next time Pat cycles back, we'll get the, uh, we'll get the uh, slides for the advanced course from him. Okay, um, I wanted to start to dive into uh, the API. And uh, we'll take a look at both the Scala and the Python side. I'll, I'll try to show both these examples. So I'll be bouncing back and forth between those a bit. Um, I'll show a little bit later on how to use IPython Notebook. There's, uh, there's some really great uh, um, capabilities out of that. Of course, that kind of leads into uh, what we've been doing with Databricks Cloud. Um, so in terms of talking about the API for Spark, the, the first thing I want to start out with is the notion of a Spark context. Uh, when you run Spark Shell, whether you're in Scala or in, in Python, um, you see this in Spark R as well. There's a special object that gets created, a Spark context. So you see this object SC. And the way that we access the API is via this special object SC. If you're writing a program in Python or Scala, Java, etc., cetera, uh, typically one of the first things you do is to instantiate uh, a Spark context and to be able to use that. And when you're working in Spark Streaming, typically you'll have a Spark context and then wrap it with a streaming context. Uh, likewise, in Spark SQL, there's a SQL context. So it's really this, this context that is the sort of the germ, uh, you know, the, the, the real core that all the API is, is referenced off of. So you can see this if you're inside of uh, a prompt. Let's see what I've got going on down here. Um, let me quit out of this and just check what the other side says. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll run um, bin, if you run this, bin spark shell. Okay, great, I've got a prompt, and it says, actually the last line of the console says, uh, spark context available as SC. So if you type SC, great. So that's what's instantiated there. Uh, most all the API is then accessible through this. Um, 
Now, inside of the Spark context, one of the things that you're working with there is there's a, there's a parameter uh, called master, which represents how this is going to run. Uh, if you're running it locally, it'll say local, or if you want to run with a certain number of threads, uh, local K for the number of threads. If your cluster manager is elsewhere pointing to a Spark standalone cluster, or a yarn cluster, Mesos cluster, et cetera, uh, then the master is keeping track of that. So what's really going on inside of the Spark context is your dependency injection. Um, it's keeping track of where you're going to run, as well as other parameters. Now, um, just to show another view of this, I, I had shown before you have a driver and then different workers for your cluster uh, to embellish on that and um, drill down on that, if you will. Uh, you've got a driver program. Inside of that is your Spark context, what I was just showing before, the SC variable, uh, and that's your dependency injection. Now, if you're running on a cluster, there's going to be some kind of cluster manager involved. Again, whether it's Yarn or Mesos or things like this, Spark standalone. Uh, so the driver is talking to the cluster manager, ostensibly, depending on what flavor of cluster manager you have. There are different worker nodes out on the cluster, and then within the worker nodes, um, there are executors running. The executors are actually what are doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones that are actually running the tasks. They're keeping track of the cache, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of the structure. Um, again, drilling down on it a bit. Now, in terms of the dynamics, um, driver connects to a cluster manager, uh, asks for resources. Uh, these are being run through the executors out on the worker nodes. Um, there's app code that's being serialized out to be run on the executors. Uh, and there are messages just go out and run tasks out there based on that. Um, now, we mentioned about this a little bit before. We'll drill down on it. But RDD, that stands for Resilient Distributed Data Set. It's the main abstraction in Spark. And it allows for both the fault tolerance as well as the parallelism. There are really two types. There's a notion of building off of a collection, like we saw with Scala, where we created an array of, of 10,000 integers and then wrapped it, parallelized it uh, into an RDD. Um, alternatively, you could bring in a data set from some other kind of data store, such as HDFS, a Hadoop data set, um, or from other storage systems like S3 or Cassandra, et cetera. Now, on the RDDs, there are two types of operations we can do. Uh, there's the set of transformations and the set of actions. And we'll, we'll take a look at these in much more detail. But the main distinction is that transformations are, are lazy. They're the part that has the lazy evaluation. So they're not com computed immediately, whereas the actions are what force the computation. Um, OK. So, as an example here, this is very similar to the first thing that we showed, but you know, creating some kind of collection, in this case, in Scala, you've got an array. Um, down in Python, you've got a list. Uh, effectively, the same thing. And then using an RDD to parallelize that, you end up with an RDD of the, of the numbers. Effectively, those are the same, either in Scala or Python. Um, yeah, and I've mentioned this before, RDDs can be created from, like I say, HBase, Hypertable, Cassandra, S3, et cetera. It could be globs. Uh, really, uh, any kind of input format that you could have in Hadoop, or if you want to extend that, um, you, know, you can take and, and define other types of input formats. Okay. And, um, okay, so here, um, using Reading in some kind of text file, uh, we'd shown this before. Uh, you know, pretty much the same thing between Scala and Python. Uh, difference, of course, in, in Python, you, you don't have the values. Uh, but otherwise, the code looks pretty much the same. So transformations, we'll show a list of these here. Transformations create, logically speaking, a, a new data set from an existing one. Uh, so you see all these successive transformations being applied on RDDs. That doesn't mean that we're actually creating or materializing that in memory. It just means that we have a graph of what needs to be computed. Uh, so the list of transformations, we've seen a bunch of these already. Uh, the, 
maps, we were doing filters, we were doing flat maps in terms of, of uh, word count, very definitely. There are functions inside that, are, that need to be run, and typically, those are closures, typically when we write this code, where there's anonymous functions that are being run inside of that closure. In Scala, it's called an anonymous function. In uh, Python, it's called typically a lambda expression. In Java, now with Java 8, you also have lambda expressions. And I knew that earlier on I was just showing Scala and Python, but I do want to underscore the point that you know, Java's a first class citizen here. And really, when you look at, at Java 8 side by side with Scala for the same apps in, uh, in Spark, they're actually quite similar. Um, other types of transformations, you can do samples, uh, unions, distincts, uh, and then here in terms of uh, group by key, sort by key, reduce by key, joins, uh, different flavors of what we can do to aggregate data. Again, these are transformations. These are not being executed right away, not until there's a need to have the data or a need to shuffle. So here we have uh, the word count again, or at least part of a word count. Um, we read in a collection of lines from a file, and then within the closures of those function calls, that's where we're applying the anonymous functions, or in Python, the lambdas, same thing. Uh, this came up a lot before. I think that uh, for, for a number of people, when you were writing the code on the, the joins exercise, uh, I talked to a number of people who were trying both a, a map or a flat map and seeing what the results were. Uh, but you get that flattened space with the map, oh, sorry, with the flat map, whereas with a map you have this sort of list of lists that's embedded. Okay, so um, let me show a little bit here uh, about Java 6 and 7 versus Java 8. If I were to do a similar kind of code as I'd shown before, but in Java, uh, back in, prior to Java 8, uh, you know, the, the notion of being able to have an anonymous function there, or the equivalent of lambda, it would take more lines of code. Once you get into Java 8, you can see that it's very, very similar to what we're doing with Scala. Um, so I, I think that's a nice progression of things. Uh, going, generally speaking, going from Java to Scala is not a huge amount of distance. I think that Scala is a, a, a nice step forward in terms of functional programming. But with Java 8, there's more and more of these kind of features out of functional programming we can leverage. One other thing I wanted to call up, there was a great blog post uh, a little bit earlier this year, uh, working with Spark with Java, and it does a lot of compare and contrast between Java 8 and prior versions. I copied one of those examples out here for the slides, but there's, there's more extended examples. And you can see Java 8 begins to look a lot more like the Scala. Okay. Now, in terms of actions, a uh, number of different types of actions, we've seen a reduce. I, I believe some of the, yeah, one of the examples had a reduce. We've definitely seen collect and take and count. Uh, there's first, you could think of as almost like an alias. It's like doing a take one. But the notion of take is that if you have n elements in your results, you can say, just give me the first set of these. Um, so if I have 100 elements, I could say take three and just get the, the top three results. There's also take sample, if you want to sample out of the results, uh, a few different flavors of that. Uh, and then, of course, we've seen this also save as. So save as text file, save as sequence file. Um, and, and we're not showing all of the actions. There's a much richer set. I'll show the API that gives the full list. Um, the one at the bottom is useful for printing out results. So at the console, if you want to format what the final results are, doing a, a for each turns out to be pretty useful. You can do a print inside there and do some formatting. Uh, there's other cases for it as well. But it's a way of iterating through all of the results. Okay, um, let's see. Any questions about the transforms and actions? It's good, it's clear as mud. Okay, good stuff. Um, okay, here I'm just showing in blue where the actions are. 
as opposed to the transformations, but you see the collects, the for each, et cetera. Now, let's shift gears a little bit. We'll talk about persistence. Uh, so Spark can use this, this kind of caching. You can make that explicit as far as telling Spark where you would want the caching to happen. Um, and this is per node, how this is happening. This is part of the fault tolerance, part of the parallelism. Um, but certainly, if you can leverage the pipeline, you can get a lot faster speed up. So there's a few different flavors of persistence. Uh, by default, when we use the, the cache function, by default, we're using memory only. So we're saying uh, persist into memory. If you want to, you could do uh, store an RDD as a deserialized Java object in, in JVM. If it doesn't fit in memory, then store, spill the parts that don't fit onto disk. So you could do memory and disk. Um, you could do that in terms of serialized objects. Uh, as well, you could force it to go to disk only. Or if you want, you could do replication. So there's a lot of different combinations of these, different flavors of how you want to be doing some kind of persistence. Um, it's, it's a kind of checkpointing, if you will, for your workflows. Any questions about that? Well, um, so uh, the question was, was there, is there any plans to be able to spill to SSDs as opposed to spilling to local disk? Um, you mean if, so if I understand, um, could you define which disks you wanted to spill to? That, that's the kind of thing. I, I, I believe, yeah, the, there's configurations for that to determine where in local disk you want to use um, if you had that set up. Although, I guess Tachyon has a bit more fine-grained control over that kind of thing. Other questions? Back there. Um, okay, so the question was about disk only. In what ways would that be a useful one? Um, interesting. I'm trying to think of a good use case that would really force that. Um, interesting. I'd, I'll, I'll open it up. Anybody got a, a good use case to suggest? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, the suggestion was about, about any kind of a audit, auditable environment or regulatory requirements where you have to persist a disk and then logging can kick in and, and you can audit that. Um, now, one thing though is this will be in local disk. Good question. I'll, I'll try to come up with some other use cases on that. That's a good question. Other questions along here? Yes. So a um, little bit different, but uh, talks about the idea is when we're running with RDDs, when we're working with RDDs, it's in the context of an application. How can two different applications share that same data, uh, that same RDD? 
That's an excellent question. So uh, it's a little bit different concept than persistence here, but, but it is related. Um, there's a couple of ways. One is there's Tachyon, which is effectively an in-memory distributed file system. Uh, looks a lot like HDFS, but it's running in-memory. So on the one hand, it, it's a way of externalizing RDDs. On the other hand, it's a way of having different applications be able to communicate through those endpoints. I could see a case where I had certain Spark jobs that were building RDDs and then persisting them into Tachyon and having other applications grab that data. So if you have a kind of producer-consumer uh, role between your applications, Tachyon is a really nice way to be able to get that RDD externalized and used as an endpoint. Um, so that would be one way to share them. Um, the other is there was a great presentation by Evan Chan uh, last Spark Summit. Uh, something they did at Oyala and published as open source is, is a blog post from Oyala engineering blog. But it's called Spark Job Server. And the idea is you've got a REST endpoint and you can submit jobs to the job server. It'll keep track of the RDDs, the context, but then you can share those across the different jobs that are being submitted. So there's a couple different flavors on that. And uh, I think that's a really interesting area is to have service-oriented architectures. We have a lot of different you know, multi-tenant apps that are sharing data through endpoints. Good point, good point. Yes? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know if you could really get into the internals of, of internal cache on the processors, L1, L2. I'd have to find out about that. But for now, yeah, the abstraction is just memory or disk. Yeah, good point. Question? What would be the difference, say, between persisting to disk only versus calling the, uh, say, like, file access? Huh, interesting. So um, what would be the difference between persisting to disk versus calling save as text? Uh, great question. So the thing about the persistence is it's, it's really a checkpoint. Um, save as is a bit more explicit in terms of it is actually writing the file out. So if you wanted to reuse the data, you'd have to read it back in. Whereas persistence, it's, it's built into the graph. You have the data already. Yeah. Kind of transparency in the checkpoint. Does that answer? Right, yeah, that's, so the question was, by default then, each, all the different partitions of data are only kept one time in memory as opposed to all the replication that you would see with HDFS. That's really important because there's actually, uh, if you see, uh, HY had um, the talks about Tachyon, and uh, that, that's a very interesting point of optimization about Tachyon, uh, where you can get rid, relaxing some of the replication, get a lot more efficiencies from it. Although you can force replication too, if you need to. There might be situations where you want that. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So it's a trade off between taking more resources for replication versus having that compute. I can imagine there's reasons for you know, latency SLAs, things like that, where you might want to just go ahead and chew up the memory. Um, I'd have to think more about good use cases there, but it, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Okay, question. How much does this fragment or automated like that process or ML lab or whatever? Interesting. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point, is that if you're working with libraries, you're at a higher level of abstraction, so how much of this is inside uh, what they're doing with an algorithm? Um, and that would be up to, I mean, this is in user land, so it really, it, it depends on how um, they're writing these libraries. Um, that's an important point, actually. That's a, that's a really good point I hadn't considered too much before, but certainly with, with machine learning algorithms, I could see cases where that would be, you know, like if I'm doing some sort of sampling, bagging, I could think of cases where I'd want to be doing, hopefully, doing some kind of caching, but yet I'd love to have some control over that as a user. Um, I don't know, if uh, Xiangru comes back in, Let's, let's catch him on that question. I'd, I'd love to get an answer on that. Other questions? I saw another hand up somewhere. 
Okay, we'll move on forward. Great, great discussions on this. I'll try to follow up with some of the TAs when they get back in here uh, about some of these specifically. Um, okay, if you want to force cache, if you want to see what this looks like, uh, let's see, I think I have Scala running, so if you want to try this, Scala or uh, Python. I'm going to read in, a, read in the readme file like we did before, and we'll do a word count, and I've stuck a cache at the end of it. Now, if I come back here and do this, and get the results out. If I do it again, quick. Um, I'm sure we could come up with better examples of that, but the notion is if you're going to repeat your actions, uh, cache comes in very handy. Uh, let's see here, what do we have? Aha. Let's, uh, a couple other topics I'd like to add in. You may not need to use these much. You may not have a lot of use cases for these, but if so, they can be important. Uh, so two things, one is broadcast variables and the other is accumulators. Um, so we'll talk about a broadcast variable. It's a way of sending out a read-only variable uh, so that it'll be cached on each machine uh, as opposed to shipping along a copy along with the tasks. So you can get some good efficiencies. Um, it, it may not be that the, the driver has to communicate this across each worker. Um, so Spark attempts to distribute the broadcast in an efficient way to reduce the overhead. Um, to try this out, I'm going to create an array, if you want to try this out, and cut and paste. Create an array, integer variables, or integer values one to three, and then we broadcast this and we have it as a broadcast variable. Um, and so now at any one of the workers can go out and access that value and get the results. So, I mean, this could be interesting if you have, I don't know, maybe a, a predictive model that's being generated and you want to be running that in parallel, doing the scoring, scaling it wide, this could be a pretty good use case where you just broadcast the model out everywhere. Um, so broadcast is one. Ah, interesting. What kind of consistency do you have? Well, in terms of the flow of execution, yes. So... Because, yes, they're all executing the same graph. Ostensibly, you've got these, these lines of code um, in your app and they're at a particular point in the graph, and so that'll be re-executed the same way on each node. Well, the notion is, I mean, you're gonna have some kind of control flow through the code here, so all the workers ostensibly would be executing that same code path. Or I'm, I guess, Put it another way, I'm struggling to see where there might be, they might come out of sync. Ah, uh, gotcha. No, that's a good point. So, um, I mean, uh, this is going to be immutable. It's not going to change. I could see if you could change the value of the variable, but it's actually, in this case here, it's immutable. You've got a Scala value. Um, so the question is, I'm not sure what would happen in Python if you tried to change the value midstream. I can imagine you get some sort of exception. I'll have to try that out. I saw another remark over there about that, though. No, okay. Yeah? yeah so when, instead of doing the broadcast, let's say I use kind of a status work. Okay. So uh, you know, I write my uh, model there and it's replicated across all my data centers. Um, because of the RDB, next time I start the job, is it going to get the new value from Cassandra, or is it going to, what's going to happen? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Uh, so the question was, if you've got some kind of external data store, such as Cassandra, and you're running this uh, along with Spark, um, and your Spark code is set up such that it's reading a model value out of Cassandra or some other kind of key value store, something like that. I can imagine Redis and H HBase, all these kind of things. Um, so is it, is it going to make the access each time it runs? Was that the question? Well, so it's basically read only, let's say, month to day the model changes. Yeah. Uh, 
Ah, that's that's an interesting thing. So, yeah. No, no, no. yeah, no, I got you. So, so the question then is, um, at, at what point will uh, the value be read? It, it could be that values are being updated, say in Cassandra, and it could be that you're reevaluating uh, the graph across the cluster, across different workers. You might lose a worker node, and and that part of the graph gets reread. If the values are changing for something that was, yeah assumed to be uh, input, um, you, you could get different results. You definitely see that. Um, so that would be one thing you have to take care of. If you're, I guess that's a good reason for using broadcast variables and accumulators in Spark is to try to have that kind of consistency in, in the code paths. Um, if you've got an external system, how, how do you synchronize it? Definitely you can get in some edge cases there. Yeah, this, this is real trivial. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like a distributed cache in, in Hadoop, in MapReduce. It's, it's much the same idea. So, um, you know, the thing is, do you, do you want to replicate this out through the serialization? You'll have more overhead if you do it that way. You're, you're right, this is kind of a toy example, but you could still get efficiencies by handling it as a broadcast as opposed to putting it in the code. Good. Other questions? Questions, comments? Okay, good stuff. Um, Python works much the same way. I can cut and paste that code, but it, I mean, it's going to show the same results. Actually, let me do that, just to keep me honest here. Um, I haven't done any Python code for a few minutes. So let me quit out of here. Python. Let's take a look. By the way, I want to clean up some stuff in here. I want to get rid of that WC just in case. Um, okay, so if I do bin PySpark, that'll launch Python. And now I've created a broadcast variable. Um, again, it's a range, one, two, three. And check the value. So much the same thing there. Now let's see, next thing up is accumulators. Accumulators are a different kind of beast. Um, these are variables that can only be added to through some kind of associative operation on the worker side. Uh, you can think of these as being very similar to counters and sums of what you would see in, in uh, MapReduce. Um, so these can be uh, working on you know, parallel distributed counters. Um, Spark supports uh, native uh, numeric value types for accumulators natively, and uh, this can be extended as well. Now, a subtlety about this is that only the driver program can ever read the value of an accumulator, even though the workers are the ones that are changing it. So to look at that here, uh, let's see, I was in Python, so we'll stay there. Um, we'll create an accumulator, and we'll initialize it to value zero. And then we'll create an RDD down here, parallelize this list. And then we'll create a function in Python so that it's, uh, it's got a, a global definition out to accumulator, and every time we call this function, we'll be um, adding x to it, whatever the parameter for the function is. Okay, and so now, using the RDD, we'll do a, a iteration through all the elements of f. Sorry, we'll do an, an iteration through all the elements of the RDD and applying the function f. And now if we take a look at the accumulator, uh, this should all be summed up. The numbers from one to four, uh, that series summed up should be 10. Great. Okay, any questions about that? Yeah. How, how can we make the uh, results then in turn available out to the workers? Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, ostensibly you could be doing a broadcast based off of this too. So it might be that you have different
phases, if you will, of your application, different, different parts of your application, where you do some kind of accumulation and you, you have to collect some sort of parameters for a later phase of the, of, uh, of the code. I could definitely see this in machine learning where you're doing some training and scoring and you need parameters. And so in that case, it, it would make sense to use an accumulator to gather some metrics, uh, but then broadcast it out. That would probably be the best way. Good stuff. Other questions? Yeah. Um, well, the thing here is, I'm definitely going to need some coffee. Um, or some water. Um, parallelize, the notion of that is to take a collection in the language. In this case, it's native in Python, having a list. It's a collection of integers. So we use parallelize to be able to lift that up into an RDD. Um, once we have the RDD, then we can start to do maps on it. But until then, it, uh, maps wouldn't work. Um, the for each, yeah, that's kind of a cheap hack. I, it was just basically stressing the point about an accumulator. Um, it could have been other types of functions as well, but that was just something cheap and dirty to show the point. Yeah. Is there a debugger? Yeah, that's a really good question. We were talking about that before. Um, you know, what kind of IDD, IDEs are good to use? Um, I definitely see a lot of people using IntelliJ. I've heard that there's uh, more specialized IDEs for Scala. I, I personally don't use that, but maybe other people have experience. Yes? Can you do the same with the accumulator? Is the value that's inside the accumulator object as there? And that's how it mutates, or do you actually get different ones back when you get there? Ah, interesting. So when you look at the accumulator, um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I got you. So that's, that's a great question. Is the, um, is the value inside of the accumulator, um, the value itself, something that will be updating and changing? So is it not immutable? And no, the, the answer is, yeah, it's changing. I mean, I, I, I did um, a for each. I did an action that applied a function, and each element was uh, uh, altering adding to the accumulator, it could have been there was more complex logic inside of there where there's some sort of if or whatever, or I could do this in several different functions. So yeah, it, it, can, it can definitely change over time. Good stuff. Does anybody have an answer actually about Scala and IDEs? That's actually, I, I don't use IDEs for this, but I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I use Emacs, so I'm kind of a dinosaur, frankly. I'm probably not the best person to answer. Yeah. Nice. Okay, nice. Yeah, I, I mean, I've used IntelliJ for it a little bit, but again, I'm, <laughs> I'm hardwired for Emacs, so I'm probably not the best person. Uh, Alrighty, excellent. Good stuff. Let's see. Uh, let's see, what's this slide trying to tell us? Uh, basically, the accumulator values are just on the driver's side. Pretty interesting stuff you can do that, do with accumulators though. I mean, if you, uh, everybody here, are you, have you seen work with approximation algorithms, sketch algorithms, uh, probabilistic data structures and all? Yeah, the, uh, accumulators get pretty interesting in that kind of context. Um, you know, where you have to just slam through terabytes of data but get some kind of approximate values out. So I, we can talk about that offline if you like. That's definitely a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, let's see, another thing that I wanted to catch up on was just uh, another uh, miscellaneous issue, but uh, there are key value pairs. Uh, if you're in Java, there's, there's the notion of a tuple two pair, where you've got pair uh, dot underscore one and dot underscore two. This also gets used in Scala, where you've got pair dot underscore one dot underscore two, which is a little bit different than what we usually see in Scala, where everything is zero indexed. So if I was looking at this in terms of a Scala tuple, I'd be looking at, you know, uh, uh, underscore parentheses zero, close parens, and, and parentheses one, uh, having it be zero index. But it, if you use this um, format for a pair, you end up using sort of the Java-ism. Yeah. Is this code not working in the current? Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, that, that, it won't help if I do it in uh, there. 
Yeah, definitely. Oh, right, yeah, exactly. This example doesn't have AMA defined. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, bad, bad example, My, mea culpa. Let's see, what can we do there? Ah, cheating. Okay, I deserve that one, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll fix up this example here. Um, okay, let's see, so, so much for constrained examples. Um, you know, there's a little bit difference. When you're working with Python, of course, it's a simple accessing a, a, a tuple or a list as you would normally do. Uh, okay, this is a good one. For more details about the APIs, let's cut over to the docs, and hopefully our Wi-Fi is working for the docs. Good. Um, so first off, I'm gonna start here at spark.apache.org, and uh, if you go to spark.apache.org, let's show it from the top. Um, if you go there, there's a number of windows, or sorry, a number of menus at the, the top of the, the window there. Um, under documentation, if you go to latest release, Spark 1.0, and uh, we'll come up here. It's got an overview. Um, there's also a quick start and a programming guide, and from there it, it breaks out into uh, oh, you know, the different use cases, SQL, streaming, et cetera. Um, now, two things I wanna show. One is I, I had just, uh, I had shown a subset of the transformations and the actions. There's actually many more flavors of this if you look through. Um, pipe, coalesce, repartition. We didn't talk about all of these, but it gets into more and more flavors of what you can do with transformations and RDDs. Same thing with actions. There's a number of others that we, well, we showed most of them, I guess I should say. But at least it gives you a little bit more uh, description about what these are doing, what the parameters are. Now, if you really want to drill down, uh, going to the API docs is probably the best reference. So, Scala docs. Um, so we can come down here and take a look at RDDs in ScalaDocs. I can find these. Um, let's see, what's a good thing I want to take a look at? Um, there's Java RDDs. Um, well, actually, this is broken out in terms of, well, here we go, broadcast variables. We were just looking at those. Um, the ScalaDocs are good. There's usually some sample code that's in there. I, I find this pretty useful. Um, if you drill down into the individual classes, there may be more or less description about them. Now, if I go to the Python part, the Python API, generally speaking, if I drill down into any of this, um, let's see, I was just a broadcast. So if I go to Python, um, most all the functions there do have sample code that you can cut and paste. Um, so I find that very helpful to be able to learn the API. Uh, it's a nice reference. Actually, a lot of the examples here, I think, were probably built out of something that was cut and paste from the API docs. Um, yeah, here's RDD, for instance. So if you want to see all the different kinds of things that, the different functions that could be accessed. Um, so for instance, there was a question about unpersist. That was one I should have looked at the docs. Um, and it's got links out to the source code as well. But um, pretty good, pretty good docs. Variants, didn't even know you could do that. Um, alrighty, let's see. Oh, the Java one, I should show Java as well. Docs, yeah, so the Java doc, kind of what you would expect. Um, let's see, we looked at broadcast before. So broadcast, great. Pretty good detail. Alrighty. Uh, let's shift gears. Well, actually, let me ask, are there any questions about APIs? Yes, sorry, you had your question. Are the, the, the Yeah, that's a great question. So um, how, how much parity is there between these different languages? Is the Scala implementation ahead of Python, et cetera? Um, well, so a larger question there is really how to compare the languages. And 
you know, definitely Spark itself is written in Scala. And so I, I do find that, like, in a lot of ways, the documentation will probably lead on the Scala side, because that's what the developers are doing, if you're looking at the dev release. Um, generally speaking, they're trying to keep these all at the same level. Uh, certainly when you get into some of the other packages, like streaming or MLlib, uh, Python is not as built out yet as the Scala side would be. Um, ostensibly, the Java side can leverage the libraries for, for Scala or vice versa. So um, Python may lag behind a bit in that way, but they're, they're trying to bring them up to parity. It's a good question. The other question that goes along with that, too, is language choice. Like, would it be better to use Scala than Python? I mean, are there reasons why Python might be better? Um, in, in my experience with use cases, there, certainly there's low latency financial kinds of use cases where they want to use Python because they can compile down to C and then from there use Atlas or whatever to uh, be able to get guarantees that they're not going to have garbage collection kick in and maybe be able to compile down and run on a, whatever kind of hardware they have, take advantage of it. So I've seen use cases where, especially in enterprise, more and more use cases where they want to use Python either for performance or just in terms of general uh, across department kinds of consistency. Um, then again, if you already have the tooling for JVM, you can leverage that. So yeah, question. Interesting. So yeah, what's, what's going on natively? So um, with Python, what happens is it's, Spark is using something called Py4j. So it's a gateway. So you're actually using native Python out on the cluster. Now, on the REPL side of it, on the driver side of it, uh, you know, you're parsing that, but then you're sending it out and actually running the native Python out on the cluster. Does that answer your question? So then you, have a, you can take advantage of a lot of different kinds of libraries out in Python there, especially for scientific computing. It could be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I've, I've done that. Uh, I mean, you just want to make sure that you've got everything... Uh, provisioned out on the cluster, uh, which is where Anaconda and Conda and other things come in pretty handy. But I've, I've done apps that combine NumPy, SciPy, uh, et cetera. And I believe there was a talk yesterday, I didn't get to catch it, but um, I, it was the, the neural network talk, was it? Or, or one of those neuroscience talk, I believe, that showed examples of combining SciPy and, um, I, I, was it SciPy, Pandas, and, and PySpark? Yeah, something like that. Question, um, Parvius, we had a question for you. No, 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 I'll, I'll come back on it later on. Um, oh, we, we did have one question, actually. The, uh, the slides for the advanced course aren't accessible. They're coming up with 503s again. Well, some people wanted to check it out, so I just, as long as everybody knew that we were having trouble with, with network again. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, oh, really? Okay, great, great. Yeah, so check email on that. We, we've... Ah. Okay. All right, just, just, yeah, minor point, but could be useful for some folks. Yep, good stuff. Um, let's see, so I was talking about language choices. Um, definitely Python's a pretty interesting thing there. Um, any other questions along those lines? Okay, good stuff. Let's try some examples. So, okay, let, let's go into uh, some of the examples that come along with uh, Spark. And uh, I think these are great as templates, if you will, for uh, building out applications. So, not necessarily working at the REPL, uh, but actually building up some kind of code module that can be compiled into a jar, submitted, etc. Um, in this case here, we'll use a script called run example, which will uh, take these, um, these, these canned examples and run them. Um, we've got a way of estimating pi using a Monte Carlo method. Um, the idea is essentially drawing, sorry, sorry, throwing darts at a square, because inside the square you can figure out where the curve is and uh, basically calculate which darts land within the curve and then take the ratio of the number of darts landing within the curve versus the rest of the square. That gives you a ratio of the area. From there, you can calculate pi. 
So to run this, let's try it first. Uh, cut and paste this line right here. And bring up, make sure you've got the, uh, yeah, okay, got the Scala REPL up. I'll get rid of my, my bad pair example here. Um, oh, you know what? Let's not do that. Yeah, let's kill the shell. Okay, so from the command line, do um, uh, dot slash bin run dash example, and then spark pi. We're going to give it a parameter of two slices. It takes that as a parameter the way it was written. And it also takes in the master. Remember, I'd shown before about what goes into a, a Spark context. In this case, we're going to pass in a parameter to say where the master is. So we want to run locally. So if I run this, all right, we'll see if we get similar results here. Hopefully, pi will converge to something close. Aha. So it comes back and it says that pi is roughly 3.14 and change. I, I kind of buy that. Yeah, okay, that's a little bit lower. Anybody getting a wildly different result? If so, we should, we should consult with the uh, physicists in the room, see if there's any room. Um, now, if we take a look at this code, the actual code itself, uh, I've got it on a slide. We can drill down and show that in the examples. Um, the idea is uh, pretty, pretty concise. We're going to import a math random out of Scala, and then, of course, import Spark. Uh, but from there, we define an object uh, for the, the code module we want to run, SpyPark, Spark, Spark Pi, um, more coffee. Um, and then uh, define a main program, takes in the command line uh, parameters there. Um, the first one of those will be, let's see, we had the slice and then we had the master. So um, this first line here, we do val conf equals. We set up a, uh, a Spark, um, Spark config, we give it a name. And then from there, we create um, Spark equals new Spark context. If this were inside of Spark shell, we probably would have called that variable SC. But the, the Spark value, the Spark variable, is essentially the same as SC that we'd seen before. Uh, one of the parameters was a number of slices. And uh, we give that explicitly. It's set by default to two. Uh, and then we calculate how many, how many darts we're going to throw, really. Uh, basically, what is that? 100,000 times the number of slices. OK, that's all set up. But then we get to the part of actually creating an RDD and simulating um, our estimates of pi. So um, we're going to say that we're going to go from the Spark context, Spark, we're going to parallelize excuse me, um, the numbers from 1 to n. And, uh, and divide that up into a number of, of slices, in this case two. And the real work gets done inside of a map where we say uh, for each element inside of that array, we're going to calculate our darts. So we're going to randomize the x and the y, and then calculate whether or not the dart's landing underneath the curve. Um, if it is, then uh, we're going to emit a 1. If not, we'll emit a 0. And then we'll have a reduce at the end of that to sum that up. That'll tell us what kind of ratio of area we have uh, under the curve. Uh, and then from there, it's pretty straightforward. Just times 4 and divided by n, you get your approximation of pi. Um, and the last thing there is just to tell the context to stop. So I mean, this is interesting because it's just a few lines of code uh, beyond what we would have done out of the REPL. Uh, but now we've got an application, and we could take and compile this and create a jar out of it. Now, let's see here. One of the things I want to show is the code itself is going to live under examples, source, main, Scala, and then the path is there. There's just one. But it's um, org.apache.spark.examples, and you'll see a number of these here. Um, if we take a look. I'll go in there. Yeah. Uh, so if I bring up uh, Spark Pi dot Scala, yeah, there's the code. And there's a number of other examples. And the main thing is I want to show, if you want to drill down and take a look at different examples, there's some great code there, um, stuff that you can reuse or cut and paste. Any questions about that? Oh, 
how, uh, whether, so would you have to worry about having, okay. So the, the question was, if you're using some sort of custom libraries, how do you get those out to the workers? Is that, yeah. yep. So um, there's a notion of being able to build the drawer files, being able to build what we call a fat jar that has all of its dependencies wrapped up into it. Um, so it, you'd have to make that part of the build to make sure that you've, you've got those included. It may be that your standard environment out on the workers is already provisioned to have shared libraries, in which case you don't have to have that all wrapped up into one jar. Um, and there's a benefit of that, then you don't have to take these enormous jar files and send them out all across your cluster. So it's kind of a trade-off that you can make in terms of build versus provisioning. How are you doing that? Ah, okay. Um, we'll, we'll show some examples of build scripts a little bit later on. We'll do some building some jars. But that's a, that's a trade-off you make in the build script. Good stuff. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. So instead of um, going through, what we showed here was this process of, of creating a main and uh, building into a jar. So is there a way of instead being able to submit this code and still run it on the cluster? Yeah, like, kind of like a script. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's other flavors of being able to submit, and you could do it as a script. Um, and I mean, it's going to be similar to what you do with Spark Shell, because it, it could be the case that Spark Shell is running attached to a cluster, where the master is a cluster. So it's effectively the same thing, kind of like reading from standard input, input there. Good stuff. Other questions? Okay. Uh, let's try some other examples. Let's see here. What else do we have? Oh, well, I mean, just to, to reinforce the point. Um, we can take a look at this also in the, the kind of pattern that we'd seen before. There's this design pattern of having a base RDD, a sequence of transformations, and then some sort of action. So I, I just I wanted to reinforce that's being done here. Actually, let me check one thing. I think we, we just lost red again. I don't know if it's me. Maybe it's my cable. Not a big deal. I'll have a few things called out in red. But so, you know, I'm, I'm a software person, so this, this is beyond me here. Um, OK, great. Let's try another example. Uh, there, so there's k-means. It's a kind of clustering algorithm. Um, and uh, we've got a built-in example here. It's going to use some of the data that came off of the, uh, the USB sticks. So. If you, uh, if you look at the directories that you copied over off the USBs, there'll be one that's called data, and inside of there, there's another subdirectory called examples-data. Um, I'll, I'll bring that up down here. Okay. All right, um, so if I were here at the, uh, at the Spark level, um, if I take a look, dot, dot, uh, data is up there. You can see dot dot data. Um, I've got a few different uh, data sets I can work with. We'd worked with the join data before, um, but there's also another one called examples. And this is something that, that is uh, shipped in the source, um, or was shipped in an earlier version of uh, Spark. Um, one of those is k-means. So let's take a look at what that data is. Um, in the k-means data, you've got several different rows. Um, there's three different dimensions on that. And you can kind of see just eyeballing it that this really fits into at least a couple of clusters, if not uh, three or more. So what we'll do is back here, you can copy this. Um, copy from examples data into the local data. So we've created a file there, k-means underscore data dot text. And then the next one is to run it with a run example. So run example, spark k-means, and we give it uh, the name of the file, the data file, and we also give it a few other parameters. We're gonna say k equals three, so we wanna go for three clusters, 
And uh, we also have our uh, 0.01 .01 in terms of a threshold um, and local as the master. And you can see down here what comes out on the, uh, on the console. Um, we've got, it goes through its iterations and it gets down to a point of where the, the delta is uh, less than the threshold that we specified. Um, and then the final centers that come out for k-means, we've got these three. One of them is roughly um, 0 0.15, and then there's another one at 9.1, and another at 0, 0. So, I mean, you can, you can tweak that, too. If I wanted to, I could come in and say, let's change this to just 2, and uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll boost this up 5. We should get two clusters out of this. So pretty straightforward as far as k means. If we take a look at um, examples code, Scala. And let's get Spark k means. Um, you can see here that this is running Breeze, a uh, linear algebra package there for what it's doing with vectors. And as far as the code itself, uh, let's get down to the main. I think this is interesting because it's, it shows an iterative algorithm. Uh, so we've got a main defined here. We take a look at the command line arguments. We've got the Spark Conf and the Spark Context. And then right here, this line, we read in, read in the text file. Um, and then we map that to uh, parse these points in, into vectors. Uh, from there, we cache that, so we persist that with the cache function at the end here. Uh, and then we define our, our k parameter as one of the arguments, uh, as well as the convergence distance that we showed, the delta. Uh, but from there, let's see. So if you're familiar with k-means, the way that it runs is you, you sample from amongst your points to find uh, your initial centers, and then you just iterate over that to keep refining where those centers are until you converge. Uh, so here we do take sample to create the initial centers, and then we iterate until we've converged. Um, pretty straightforward as far as finding out where the centers are and calculating the distances for each. All right, any questions about that? Yeah. So how is this going to be partitioned across the cluster? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in this case here, you know, the, the data itself wasn't that large. So we've, we've just got... It was what it was like six lines or six rows or so, and it was only three dimensions. So the notion is that if we were running this off of HDFS, how would it be partitioned? Um, you know, that's really a function of how that file would be partitioned initially. We could try to force it to be more partitioned, but it's kind of a function of that. So if I had one monstrous terabyte file of three-dimensional data, five-dimensional, whatever, it's not going to automatically split it out and recognize that this is one file? Well, if it's if it's coming out of HDFS, yeah, depending on the kind of reader, there'll be some splits in there. So yes, it will be split. So the question is, how smart do I have to be to, to, to where to split it? Um, okay, so let's take a look here as far as the RDDs. Um, well, I mean, the other side of it is, is that once you've gone through an iteration here, you've got RDDs that define the, the points, but then you've got RDDs that define the centers. Yes, yes. It, 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 no, no, no. You're right. It, 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 in this case, it's a function mostly of the size of the, the input data is really going to be what's defining the kind of parallelism. I mean, I could see cases where you could define, maybe not here with k-means, but you could define some other type of intermediate data downstream, some of the artifact that's actually wider than your input data. You could be building up tables. So you might have relatively small input data, but intermediate values that are quite large. So you want to understand about the dimension of that and how that's going to be partitioned. Um, as far as the question, of, the question was like, how much do you have to define that in your logic, your business logic, to be able to get that parallelism? Um, and again, based off of how it's being split, how it's being partitioned by the, the input, um, you know, if, if, if the input size is the hard problem, um, you control it off of the partitioning there. If, 
if it's some sort of intermediate data, obviously the input partitions aren't going to have any effect on that. Um, you can force the number of slices, like we saw with, with the pi example. That would be one way to control it. It will try to do it as parallel as possible. Oh, good question. Squared. Uh, n not necessarily, if it could be operating on a partition. In this case, it's actually being imported out of Breeze. Yeah. But no, I mean, if you can think of it, um, square distance, let me see how it's being used there. Or it goes to a temp. Yeah, so, I mean, this is the case where you're having to compare each point versus the center and then recalculate the centers. So that can be done in parallel because each partition can be doing this independently. Yeah. What? Well, that code's being serialized out to the different partitions. The idea is that this can be run independently by each different partition. Question? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I hear, I hear what you're saying there. Um, especially if there's some kind of side effect, right, in, in a library. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a sticky point. Um, in this case here, I don't believe that there's going to be any kind of a side effect. You're just calculating the distance off of a point versus the updated center. Uh, but yeah, that could cause problems. Definitely could cause problems, especially if you're looking at things where, like we were seeing presentations yesterday, they were using JNI to call out to fairly complex C code. Um, and, and certainly that model is not going to be pure for very long. So um, that's another, another gotcha you have to take into account. Does that answer, answer your question? No. no? <laughs> I don't really know if there's a good answer. I mean, so, I mean, this is a hard problem if you're, if you're calling out to the libraries and breaking the, the paradigm. Yeah, so how, who's calling out to the library? Oh, oh, okay. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the code that serializes running out on the workers. So, I mean, the, the code that's being run by out, out there, that's calling the library out there. Um, so if the library itself has some notion of shared data, that could be problematic. Right, so this is actually being, so this actual logic right here is inside of a def, inside of a function, and um, it's, it's a for loop. This is all Scala code that's being called. So what you're, you're getting in is, okay, you've got your, your P points and then your centers. Um, there's an int in there too as well. Um, we got that right. No, no, no. You just got those two parameters. Um, the place where it's being called, closest point is down here. It's being called inside of a map. So the notion is that rather than having an anonymous function, you've actually got, well, this is not be an anonymous function. Yeah, you're going from P, a tuple, your points, and then you're mapping that out into the distance. So the thing is that this is being called inside of a closure, inside of a map, and uh, it's, it's just really replacing other logic that you might have there. Um, I mean, we could see this as well in something like Python, where you might have a lambda function that has some pretty complex logic inside of it. It's being called inside of a map. Or you might want to take that and wrap it into, or actually define uh, a def, create a function for it. Um, so it's a similar kind of thing here. Um, does that? Is that it? So it's being called independently then by all the elements across all the different partitions. Good stuff. Other questions? Okay. Oh, let's see here. What else we got? How about page rank? Aha. Yeah.
Right. It's it's telling you yeah which which cluster is or which center. Right. For each point, it's telling you which. Yes. So if I've got this right, then for each. It's, it's going to be an RDD then, and, and so that will be destroyed and recreated, or a different one will be created each, each iteration through. Yes? Sure. Um, so closest point, mapping to a point. So w what you're doing there effectively is you're returning back from the line that calls closest point, you're finding um, for a given p, what is the other closest point to it? And so the points themselves are structured as x1, y1, or x and y. And so what we're going to do is calculate the, 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 the distance between them. Right? Isn't that what we're trying to get? Uh, well, okay, so you're operating on P. P is the element that's coming across in the map, and you're trying to find the closest point to it. So you're going from P out to, um, uh, yeah, this map here, where you've got two points. And then to follow the logic down here, collect his map, and then calculate the square distance on it. Is that? Um, as far as the synchronization of this, this is going to be, yes, how parallel would this be? So the notion there is that's actually logic inside of Scala, and you'd have to get closest back. Yeah, these, it's gonna, it's, there's going to be synchronization on each of these, right? You have to wait for these. So, well, let me think about that. So where, you've got to reduce by key there. That's coming off of closest, and then you've got new points. Um, I would probably have to, well, let's see, points, that's, that's a map. So you come down here and you get the collect as map. So ostensibly that's where the action's gonna be collect as map, if I'm reading this right. The others are transformations. The map and the reduced by key should be transformations, and the other map. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, let's try another one here. Let's see. There's, a, there's another example that's included uh, that shows how to do a page rank. Um, so the idea is that you have IDs for uh, different pages. You have representations for different web pages, and then the links that they have out to other web pages. So the data set here, you can uh, cut and paste this one. We'll copy from, again, the data file, examples data up above. We um, copy down a file, page rank. I'll take a look. And so there I've got uh, web page ID one in the first column, and there's a few links coming out of it, um, links out to pages two, three, and four. And then the pages two, three, and four respectively all link back to page one. So it's a pretty simple graph as far as a collection of four pages linking to each other. One of them off obviously has more outbound links. Um, so if you run this, as well it has more inbound links. Um, if you run this, then um, bin run example, Spark page rank, and we'll give it that data set that we want to run, and we'll say we want to run it for 10 iterations. Uh, again, master is local. Okay, and it'll come back calculating the page rank, um, page four. So page two, three, and four have a page rank of 
0.75 and change. And then page one is the one that had all the outbound links, but also all the inbound links, and it gets a, a higher page rank of uh, 1.74. Now, if we take a look at the code, push down into examples, uh, source means Scala, or Apache, and uh, take a look at Spark. Samples. Where am I? There. There we go. Um, Spark page rank. Okay, so this is another good example of an iterative kind of uh, algorithm. This is something that, that's a lot more concise than if you're going to be doing it in, uh, in MapReduce. Um, a lot of this is set up. We're getting our parameters. Here we're creating a Spark context. Um, here we actually start bringing in lines. So uh, we, we parse this file. We'll parse it into the links so we know what the identifier is for each web page and what the different outbound links are. Um, and from there, there's a, there's a, a map to do the parsing. Uh, do a group by. And then down here, we've got map values. OK, but the real iteration is right here. We're going to say from, from one to whatever iterations, I think in the command line it was 10. Um, we're going to yeah, do a join on the ranks, uh, flat map out. So basically, we've got URLs versus the ranks that they had. Um, and then we'll, that map, urls.map, is where you're going to recalculate um, the rank. That goes back down in here. The next line, you've got ranks equals contribs reduced by key. Sum those all together. And the page rank, um, alpha equals 0 0.15 as the random, hey, I might jump out to another page, um, plus 0.85 times whatever the sum of the rank was. So we'll iterate on that for a certain count and then output the results. Um, and let me undo. I thought I knew Emacs. I think I need more coffee. I think I'm pretty sure. Uh, come on. Now I definitely need more coffee. Uh, what am I doing? You know what? I'm going to save this guy. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll pull it back off. Yep. Yeah. Um, any questions on page rank? Sound good. All righty. Um, now, in the previous, the other timing that we did this thing, we would have been at a different point. We're actually making pretty good progress, so don't mind about it saying lunch. Um, I'd like to shift gears, though. I'd like to talk about a, a different, a little bit more of a lecture here, um, and then some demos within it. So part of the thing about Spark is that we can have one unified common engine underneath, but be able to handle a lot of different types of use cases. So the title here is Unifying the Pieces. Um, the idea is that rather than having a lot of different specialized systems, some for handling graph, some for handling uh, uh, streaming, etc. instead, with a couple of changes, a couple of additions to MapReduce, we're able to get a more general purpose engine and handle these all within the same code. Uh, so, in that context, uh, one of the things I'd like to show is, is Spark SQL. Uh, we'll go through that in more detail, as well as working with an example of Spark Streaming. And, uh, you know, along with this MLlib, I'm not going to really drill down into Shark because a lot of that is being deprecated in lieu of Spark SQL, et cetera. But in terms of Spark SQL, let's bring this up. Um, the notion of Spark SQL is really interesting. At, since we have this abstraction of RDDs already, and we know about relational tables in SQL, um, Spark SQL allows you to go between the notion of a table and an RDD in both directions. So you can really intermix SQL commands within the functional program. Um, it's also very interesting in the sense of uh, MLlib and other types of abstractions being built on top of Spark is that you could be doing your data preparation um, using a combination of, uh, of SQL commands. 
Uh, there's a, a great blog post that was introducing this. Uh, Michael Armbrust, uh, Reynolds Hen, had uh, a good introduction here a little bit earlier this year about Spark SQL. And this was subsequently rolled into Spark 1.0 in the release. This is going to show, if you scroll through here, it's going to show a lot of different examples of, of SQL queries. Um, but let's try some of those. So I've got, here's some code here. You can see the, the top line, it says uh, SQL context. So this is meant to be run inside of uh, Spark Shell. Um, so cut and paste. But the first line there is going to take and build a SQL context off of SC, the Spark context. And we're going to import all the SQL context. Then the next thing is we're going to create another case class. Uh, so for each, each row in the table, if you will, uh, we've got a notion of a person. And a person has a name and an age. So uh, then we're going to go and create an RDD from uh, a sample file, um, examples, uh, source main resources, people.txt. We'll take a look at that. But we, we create this RDD off of a data file. Um, effectively, it's comma separated values. So we'll go in and do a split on that and then map it to where we're um, instantiating an object for each row, a person object. At that point, um, we can take this RDD and register it as a table. And so from that point forward, we can go out and make SQL queries using the name of that table in a from clause. Uh, so we see people registered as table people, and then down here there's a SQL command, select name from people, where uh, essentially we're looking for teenagers, where age is greater than or equal to 13, less than or equal to 19. At that point, you get back an RDD, and you can do transforms on it like you typically would, or actions like you typically would with RDDs. So it, it shows the point of being able to go back and forth between the notion of table and RDD. And this is a really powerful notion. Um, so try this out. Uh, let's see here. Pardon? So the case class person, is that Spark or is that Ah, very good point. So uh, no, that's very much Scala. Uh, and in Python, you could do an op some kind of class instead. Uh, but yeah, what that's doing is basically defining the schema, if you will. It's saying that, uh, well, let's take a look at the, the file first and then bounce back to this. Um, examples, source, main, resources, people, text. So inside of here, ls example, source, main, resources, people. So I've just got, there's three lines in here, and it's sort of comma separated, not exactly, but um, you've got these three people named, uh, so Michael, Andy, Andy, and Justin, different ages, and the idea of the case class for people is that it'll wrap these. And by, by wrapping these as objects, then you're imposing the schema, and when you register the RDD as a table, then SQL picks up that schema. And there's other ways to do that. It could have been serialized data where you had metadata along with it. But in this case, we're using the case class to sort of impose that schema. Um, OK, other questions about that? Yeah. Um, so, a uh, question about that. I apologize. There, there's some kind of weird fan back here, so it's like totally tweaking my ear on this side. Um, so, in terms of the files that you have underneath, you could be inheriting schema along with that. Um, you could have something that's coming out of, say, Parquet, like a, a serialized out of a column store, and then you'll have the schema along with, with that that it'll pick up. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, good. Other questions I saw? Yeah. Oh, can you do a table? Yeah, you can do joins on this, too. Uh, well, I mean, in terms of SQL, uh, you would register a couple of different RDDs as tables. You could uh, select whatever from people uh, join. What?
Yeah, you could. So you could join. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we could have, like I say, an address table with names versus addresses, um, and then join on names. So, well, no, I, I, could, I could have two different RDDs. If I had two different data files coming into that, I could create two different RDDs, register both of them as tables. So I could say people register as table people, and then maybe address, register uh, as table address. And then down in the SQL, I might say something like select name from people uh, join address on name. Yeah, exactly. So that's one case. You can do it inside of the SQL. Now, if you start getting a lot of like nested query kind of situation, it can get pretty complex in SQL. The other thing you can do is similar to link in .NET, or you, it's called a DSL here um, in Spark SQL, but basically um, unravel some of that logic as function calls. Um, and it's really good in nested cases. But I'll, I'll show a little bit more of that later on. Other, other question, yeah. Ooh, good question. Uh, I mean, that's just logical. So, I, I, yeah, I, that's not an action. Yeah. O other question. I believe that's operating in the meta store. I'll have to, I'll have to find out about that. But you can use the Hive meta store. You can also bring the definitions out of Hive meta store. Question, yeah. How does RDD exist? Ah, interesting. Uh, you mean as, as far as the registered tables? I don't know. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to find out. Yeah. Uh, okay, a lot of questions. Let me take them from sort of this side over. Yeah. Yes. Yes, very much so. Well, I mean, it, it, so we'll take a look, but when you look at the graph out of this, they're going to be very comparable. Um, there, there's actually good reasons for doing it in SQL. I mean, there's, there's more optimizations you can probably do in SQL. Um, there's Catalyst, so you can get smarter optimizations there. And also, it's kind of a matter of, of your environment and your team. Probably a lot more people know how to write SQL. So, I mean, I, I could see writing an app where it just read SQL queries being submitted, but ran this under the hood. Good question. Um, okay, let me take them across this way. So the next one. Yeah. I'm looking for a register as table in Scala doc and not finding it. Is this what we're looking at, or is it hiding somewhere? Register. Um, that's going to be, let's see, so we brought this in SQL context. Or I expected it to be on RDD. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me try and dig that up. I mean, that should be coming off of SQL context. I'll, I'll look it up. Let me, let me grab that in a bit. Well, let me look it up right now. Schema RDD. So yeah, uh, SQL context will bring in a flavor, a uh, different flavor of, or I'm using, using that term, a different type of RDD. And let me see, where's my overview? Down here, and API doc, Scala doc. And then down here, schema. Oh no, I don't want that. There, schema. Yeah. So under here, um, so we've imported um, SQL, and there's a schema RDD, and we should have register under this. Yeah, registers table. That's a good question, because you're coming off of people uh, off of SC. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. But the, the, the example does actually run, so let's find out where. 
Let's run this. If I call this, if I go through and execute this, this, this should work out fine. Uh, back here, okay, I'm gonna define my case class. Case class, um, let's in create the RDD. Yeah, so here's the culprit. And it comes back as a regular, yeah, off of, uh, uh, Spark context, it's creating a regular RDD, mapped RDD. And from that point, what is people? It should just be what we, we saw just right there. SC should be Spark context. Let's try this. So um, people to debug string. Nap, you got me on that one. I'll have to find out. Spark context. Can we check out of SQL context and see what's registered in there? Um, I, you know, I don't know where register as table is coming from in this case. That's a great question. I'll have to dig this up. Um, is there any other instances of it? SQL query here. Off of schema RDD function. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to find out what the mechanism is for that coming in because it should just be this one I'll have to check. Uh, if Reynolds run, yeah, question. A pure HQL. So the story about uh, Shark was that, I mean, the announcements were that it was more and more of the Hive code was going to be backed out and replaced with Spark SQL. And the announcement here more recently was that, uh, yeah, Shark is going to be deprecated in favor of, of uh, Spark SQL. Um, but there, there still will be support for Hive. So you can run, uh, there's, a, there's a different kind of context. I'll show that. I believe it's on the next slide, actually, or one of the next slides, where instead of creating a, a, a SQL context, you create a Hive context. And then um, you're running HQL. And you can also use the Metastore. Yeah, question. So, um, yeah, you can, you can define user-defined functions uh, within the language here and, and be able to add those. I don't have any examples. That's kind of beyond the scope of what we we're going to show here for Spark SQL. Uh, but there is some of that in the advanced course, I believe, in the Spark SQL context. Could, so the question is, could you reuse the user-defined functions from Hive? Right? No, I, you... you uh, let me let me defer to some of the docs on that. They've, they've got some examples over there, but no, there will be constraints. Other questions? Okay. Let's let's complete this example. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to call a SQL query. Select name from people where age greater than or equal to 13, less than or equal to 19. And you see what comes back is an RDD. In this case, it is a schema RDD. And it also reflects out, it, it prints out what the query plan is. So taking a look at that, teenagers dot to debug string. Uh, so you can see what the query plan there is. It would be similar if you were writing this code in Scala or Python. It'd be a very similar kind of uh, uh, graph. 
uh, the query plan is effectively the, the DAG that you're going to compute. Okay, now if I take um, teenagers at this point, I could say teenagers collect. Okay, and it'll run it, and in this case, there was just, out of the three people, one of them qualified as a teenager, Justin. So it's, it's printing out the label for that. Okay. Now, this will go back to an earlier question. You could um, also have a hive context, alternatively. And in that case, um, yeah, you're reading pure HQL. Um, and you can also be accessing the Hive Metastore. So this is good if you have a lot of existing table definitions uh, data already in Hive, a lot of uh, HQL built up for that. Yeah, question? Uh, let's check about this one here. This came out of an earlier example. Um, I'll track it down, but um, importing Hive context, let me find out about it. If I want to run HQL, do I have to wrap everything in an HQL function like that as opposed to using SQL? Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to run this example because I don't have this all set up for a Hive context, but the uh, question. Let me let me dig that up. Probably the best example here. Let me dig up the docs where we get into Hive. Um, let's see here. Spark overview. Okay, if you go to programming guide under Spark SQL, um, there should be a section there on Hive. Parquet, Hive support down here. Um, so configuration of Hive is done by placing your Hive site.xml in, in the subdirectory conf. Uh, also, there's a point that you, you do need to recompile. You need to do an assembly. Um, so be able to uh, do spark underscore hive equals true, and uh, you see that line right up here. So if you wanted to run this, we'd have to reassemble this is all, but we'd also have to have hive set up. A bit more on the configuration, but very doable. Um, let's see, anything else I can glean out of, um, out of this part here? Users who do not have an existing Hive deployment can experiment with local Hive context, similar to Hive context, but creates a local copy of the Metastore in the warehouse. Um, hmm, okay, I'll have to get that going as an example. Okay, other questions? What time is it? Ah, you know what? It's, um, it's 2.30. How about if we say, let's see, what, what, what are we looking at as far as sequencing here? Um, we're coming up on parquet and then streaming. Uh, this is probably a pretty good time for some coffee, and I also remember that they wanted to synchronize on one of the points uh, with next door. So how about if we take a break for about 10 minutes? Sound good? I need coffee. Hi. Yeah? Good. Make sure there's something on it. <laughs> Great. Okay, good on so good on so so the main is a straight the, the main is a straight uh, uh, Scala function. So this is this is gonna run once. Yeah, that's your okay, entry point. In, in okay, so now entry point on the driver. Right. So now on the uh, um, let's see. So 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 on the the K points. Um, so okay, okay. So okay. so we get the data. So at the point that we get the 
uh, we cache the data, we get K points can, can happen in, in parallel. So, K, so we've initialized our centers. Right, so, so down here. Yep. Uh, okay, so closest, this data map, going to be spread out across the cluster. Uh -huh. the, uh, the point stats going to be spread out across the cluster. Yeah, so far these are transformations exactly. all the way through here. Exactly. Uh, the map is the, the action that's going to also be spre spread across the world. Transformation. Yeah. Right. And then we get collect as map. That'll collect as map. Action. Okay, that, that's yeah. the action. Okay, so, so now here, this, this last, these last three lines, um, so this is just all straight Scala, Scala code, right? Exactly, because so, you're just you're looking at the escape so parameter. So at this for point, each. so at this point, we're going to loop through every single point and bring it into the current thread, right? Not every single point. What you're going oh, to do is well, K points, every K K, K. K points is K points is a straight array. So every every different center, you're going to loop through every every different center. Uh, Zero to K will be the number of centers. So in this case, they'll, they'll okay. be three or whatever. The oh, okay. I wanted to ask you about this example. Got when, it. when the data gets partitioned, right. so each worker is going to see a subset of the data, right? Right. So that means that when you're doing a clustering, each cl the, each clus the, cl the workers are doing clustering across all the points they know about. So is there a point when you collapse all, all the findings? Because you're going to have multiple centers. If you have three workers, wouldn't you have, couldn't you have a bunch of centers? Ah, so, you so, you're, you're, centers? You're, you're, so what you're doing, though, is you're, you're parallelizing across the data, not the centers, right? You mean all the data is replicated each worker for this? No, no. The, 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 each worker has a partition of the data. Right. But the centers are replicated. Oh. But the previous centers were. Okay. Oh, they're sharing the centers? Yeah. Oh, See, because on, on each iteration, you use the last, the centers that were produced at the last iteration. And everybody sees the same set. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so that okay. we can do it All right. Now, there, there, there's other tricks because there's like K means plus plus and K means pi pi. And there, there's, there's ways for some of this to be more parallelized earlier on. But once you get in the loop, then it's So where's the object where they share all the centers that are calculated? Like, how is that globalized? That's what I'm trying to understand. Um, I'll need more coffee for that. OK. <laughs> where's my K points right here? OK. So for each, each point, then, you're figuring out which is the closest center. Can I see what data is from? Certainly, certainly. Where? Yeah, right here. So here you, you've dug it, you've, you've pulled in your data and parsed it. You've parsed your lines, in your, your vectors for each row, right? And then you initialize your, your centers just at random. And here, now a, a, across the cluster, each partition is looking at each data point within this partition uh, and calculating who's the closest center to it. Oh, to their data. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, so all that, because data is seen across all the all the things. Right? Yeah, the the, the, the data is all out there in, in the cluster. So okay. each worker has a partition. Right. That's that's why we're calling data. They, not but they don't have a subset right. of the data, right? They have all the data. No, no. But no, it's no, because the, the, the data. The workers are partitioned. Data is oh, partition has a. I'm sorry. Each worker has a partition. Yeah. So uh, it's just. I mean, so lines dot map means that that's an extension in RDD. Exactly. Okay. It is yeah. RDD, yeah. And that's so that's the the base lines is the base RDD. Right. And then data is a transformation of that RDD. So parsing it's still it. a parsing it, and so that's still available across everything. So okay. when you do data dot map, that uh, means uh, it's uh, available. Oh, okay. 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 And note note the cache there too, right? Yeah. And it's cache. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have. To uh, I have a question. Maybe a clarification. Okay. Yeah. For yeah. SQL part. So I think so. If I, when you initialize an SQL context, yeah. right? So. Uh, then that does these implicit versions. Oh, that's what's going on. Okay, right. so actually it's operating on SC to do well, implicit. Yeah, well, yeah, what happens is the, um, so you have regular RDDs, and so when you do, you know, 2 debug, et cetera, they show up as regular RDDs, but the Spark SQL context does this. So that's where register to table shows up, right? Okay. So it's not in the RDDs, but it's any RDD that shows up in that Spark context. Gets trans, you know, gets an explicit version to, you know, kind of a, uh, a SQL RDD. A, a scheme RDD. A scheme yeah. RDD, yeah. right, where a registered a table. Okay. Which is, which is up, I think that's what's going on. I just want to make sure. That, that, that makes more sense. I, I apologize. I, I'm, I'm, okay. I, I did not know an okay. answer on that one. So that, I'll buy that. So, no, so then my question is um, so I think you answered it with Part A, but if I have some other. So, <clears throat> so I'm using that map to define essentially what this schema is. I mean, I think like 
uh, schema RDDs have uh, implicit support for our Scala case, right? Um, but if I have some other some other type of key value in there, like if I'm using like React or Cassandra or something like sure, that, sure, yeah. then um, this, uh, so kind of this kind of clarification of my question, then could I would I still be able to define a case um, for the, ah. for those instead of text files, or is there some other type of Right. So if you have some kind of, if you have like a tablet file. Yeah. Right. If I have a tablet file, you know. So I, you may answer it when you go to when we get to parquet. When we we'll get to parquet, we'll show yeah. some examples of that. Okay. And, and and just that's probably the same kind of process I would do. For, for yeah. Yeah. Like for Avro and all. I I don't have any good Avro examples yet. Yeah. I mean, it's not Avro in particular. I care about, but if I have some, you know, like like we might we from our case libraries, we have star data. Actually, yeah, there, there's uh, one of the data science guys who's here. I can't. We, we can grab him too and find out more about what they're doing by default. Okay. Hi. Hey, sorry, I'm being really slow on this, but I'm not quite oh, getting great. the double okay. shark thing. You're probably faster so, than me. I haven't finished my coffee yet, so. <laughs> just me. Um, so today, one of the main ways that uh, the analysts at our company use it is they do an interactive job. So they'll log into Sharp today and just start throwing SQL queries. Is that something that's not going to be supported going forward? Or? Um, yeah, so that that is kind of a question. Uh, do you lose that prompt? Um, Are we going to have to start teaching them how to wrap it all in Scala or something? I, I, I That was, you know, to, to be completely frank, that was something that kind of surprised me. Because, um, yeah, the, the Shark all the shark functionality includes that. And that's been really good with teams that I've had before because, yeah, they get a SQL prompt, they can just work there. And, and you've got the super it. easy way for running the HQLs, right? You yeah. just throw it at the interpreter. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it seems to me like the short answer is you have some other kind of interpreter you can just keep throwing SQL at. Right, okay. Um, I, I would be surprised if they don't build that, if they haven't built it already. Yeah. Um, it, sound, it sounded to me like it was more a matter of just the projects. I mean, it's, Shark had been kind of like a parallel project, but now it's brought in yeah. some. Um, I don't know, if we can grab, I'm not seeing, like Michael Armbrust would be the best person, but I'm sure there's a few others too. If we could find Reynolds or some of those, we can try and get okay. more details in that. I'll see you after it, and maybe you can hook me up and I'll just ping him an email or something. Yeah, I, I can intro. M Michael's the best person to, to answer about the roadmap on that. Pat okay. Wendell would also be a good person to talk to. Yeah, I just need to figure it out because it'll obviously uh, affect our adoption of later versions if we want to upgrade, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I can't imagine that they'll get rid of that part of it because that would just be a slam dunk. It seems, yeah, it seems like a step backwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jackson. Jackson. So, so that's question on core processing best practices um, because it's a long time here or a little bit of a time here doing the data cleanups by trimming and right. doing all that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm wondering when you get a whole bunch of different data and stuff like that, do you, do you, do you have sort of those ETL rules set up to make sure that you're handling all the different scrubs? It seems like a lot of time that you guys who are doing these queries have to each sort of trim the data and do the thing. Right. Having a clean data set, making it slow down and start doing those cleaning and things like that. So I just wonder what do people use sort of those visual tools to, to sort of set up, to say everything's coming in from these different sources. We're gonna I mean, yeah, no, this speaks to some larger issues because if you're in a bank and you've got, you know, 12 different departments in however many countries or cities, um, how do you get them to use it? Are you <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yeah, no, no, and, and there's actually, well, there's, there's a couple of gentlemen here from Sydney who are actually working on this that came out of banking um, and they have a thing called Ivory that's a feature store. It's exactly for this purpose. Okay. And the idea is that you throw the raw data in and you define the transformations on the features and then from there basically pull out a view when you want to consume it. Okay. You know, train a model or score something or whatever. Um, but all of that is effectively lazy evaluation. Okay. But there's a consistency of rules. So that if you have 20 different departments consuming off of it, they're all getting the same column, the same transformations on that. Okay. Um, and that's kind of a that, that's kind of a novelty to me. I mean, I, I'd seen 
before the case where people just had, let's throw everything in HBase, and everybody goes and writes a scalding app, yeah. and we'll all get wildly different results depending on how well we did it, yeah. um, which is a bad thing. And so the, the notion of a feature store is something, to me, relatively new. On the other hand, what Databricks is doing with Databricks Cloud is also kind of answering that. I mean, they didn't show every, I, I, do I have the mic up? No, no, I'm, I'm okay. But I mean, you know, second, effectively, that's a that's a platform, yeah. the cloud thing, and the idea is meant to be consumed as a, a notebook as an API to be published. Okay. So ostensibly, you would have you know a team of people who are doing your ingest of data, your ETL, and once they prepare that, everybody else consumes all that inventory. Okay. And ostensibly, also, I don't think I'm letting too many cats out of the bag, but you know, other people could be bringing in their proprietary software, building on that. Okay. Um, that's, that's one of the issues. I mean, you know, in, the, in the good old days, we would just throw it all in a warehouse, right? And then there would be a DBA that would tell everybody, thou shalt. And there would be rules. Yeah, yeah. not the Wild West. Um, but that only worked so well. And so now we're kind of having to re-evolve some of these things. Well, especially when you build a popular tool, then everybody's just like, oh, okay, throw it really quickly. And then you're like, no, no, hang on. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Don't get too relaxed. <laughs> And, and if you do actually have a public company that has to be audited and has a lot of customers, it becomes quite important. Um, I, can, I can show you, well, actually, um, Ben, those guys are probably in the advanced course. In fact, I'm sure, sure of it right now. But they're, the company's called Ambiata. They're from Sydney. Ambiata, A-M-B-I-O-T-A. Uh, A-T-A. They're actually the people who created Scooby, if you've ever seen Scooby. Yeah, let's get started. Yeah. Because it would sort of accept might not have have it evaluated yet, basically, oh, or, or realized it could get a consistency. Right, right. So, which I thought was strange because it seemed like the whole benefit is that you can use this broadcast variable, right? Yeah. And all the workers could reliably realize it whenever and see the same data. Yeah, yeah. I would have, I would have thrown an exception at that point. Sure. Right. Maybe it does, but it doesn't it doesn't state in the docs. We'll, we'll experiment. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, um, quick question regarding the tweeting files are right. So, um, one of the examples or one of the things you can throw with not the bad data data is different files. So, in that example, would you just rely on the state powers to find the reconcile missing columns? Ah, so if there's, if there's missing values coming yeah. out of that, how would you handle that? Um, Values coming in, how would you yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of that's going to have to be a business logic. And frankly, I would, it depends on what I'm working on. If I was doing machine learning, I'd want to, in some cases, handle that pretty carefully. Okay, so it's I, I, so the Scala class I saw a I finance can't. problem that was handled horribly, and the company almost went out of business. So I can't put default parameters? Yeah. No, no. You, we, default parameters for the case class? Yeah. Yeah, that would be sense. looking to whatever the semantics are in a case class, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. Although, frankly, again, if I was doing any sort of like training at scale, I'd want to handle the inputs pretty carefully. Um, so it's coming in and out of existence, uh, but it's under. Here, let me, let me come back. These were, yeah, these were totally different um, courses. So let me grab it here. Um, not that, not that, not that, not that. Let me do this up. It's under Databricks, or it was under Databricks training. No, not. Let me take that back. Under Spark Summit. We'll see. Ah, good. Okay, that's looking better. And then click training, 
and down at the bottom, right here. Slides. Slides. Okay. So far, so good. Again, that one's been fading in and out of existence more than the current does. I'm actually, the old trading cycle is kicked back in, but I mean, yeah, I have no idea how much it is. No whiskey in it, though, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. And actually having the process that's, yeah. we have a daemon uh, like service, and it actually submits itself to, oh, to yeah. the cluster. Yeah, yeah. It actually works pretty well. I was wondering if I wanted to do this in the embedded mode, where I have like this service that's running, and on a, a request, it will submit a job, but it doesn't have to necessarily go into the command line, maybe it has to shell out or anything. Yeah, there's, there's ways to do that. I mean, you might want to drop it into some kind of class or whatever. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, yeah. 